On behalf of the NYUAD Institute, I would like to welcome you to the public lecture today. My name is Olivia Chung. I am an assistant professor of psychology at NYU Abu Dhabi. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Isabel Gautier. And I'm particularly excited about uh, Isabel being, uh, Professor Gautier being here because she was my PhD advisor. And I'm uh, very happy that she's here to visit Abu Dhabi and to give this public lecture. Professor Gautier is the David K. Wilson Chair of Psychology at Vanderbilt University. She received her BA at uh, University of Quebec at Montreal, her PhD from Yale, and then she did uh, postdoctoral uh, um, fellowships at uh, Yale and MIT concurrently. Her research interests uh, include the behavioral and neural study of visual object recognition, especially in the domains of uh, perceptual expertise. Uh, that is the recognition of faces, letters, and musical notation. And her work has implications for disorders like um, autism or congenital face blindness. She has offered over 120 peer-reviewed scientific uh, articles, which have been cited over 13,000 times which is quite a lot. And so she has received many honors, including um, the Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contribution from the American Psychological Association and the Trollen Research Award from the N National Academy of Sciences. And apart from her research contributions, she has also served as the chief editor of Journal of Experimental Psychology General which is the flagship journal uh, in the field of experimental psychology. And she is a wonderful mentor, and she is also a highly ins inspiring role model, uh, especially for uh, female students uh, who are interested in science. And uh, since becoming the chief uh, editor of the General of Experimental Psychology, General, she has increased involvement of women, particularly junior women, in the editorial board. And uh, today, 50% of the editorial board members are female. So I can keep on going, uh, but I'm not going to have enough time to uh, tell you all about her achievements and contributions. But I can tell you that in today's lecture, she's going to tell us about uh, her work on creating a new science on visual intelligence. And the title of her talk is, Is There a Visual Intelligence? And so please join me to welcome Professor Gautier. Thank you, Olivia. That was a very um, generous introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to, to visit Olivia. I'm always very proud of um, my students, um, and, and it's been such an honor to visit um, your campus, this beautiful new campus, uh, and, and, and it's exciting to be in, in, you know, in this place at, at such an early time um, for this university. I want to thank the, um, the university for inviting me, um, and, um, and I hope you get something you know, from this talk. There will be um, uh, some, some real science, but I will be happy to um, answer any questions you have at the end about anything that I say, so please um, keep that in mind. Okay, before I begin, I want to thank some of the people, the students currently in my lab, some research assistants um, and collaborators um, in and outside of uh, Vanderbilt University, where I work in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the person who's been most involved with the research that I'm going to show today is um, Jen Richler, um, but several of these other people have been involved in one way or another, and so uh, it's important not to forget the people who really do the work, um, so I thank them very much. So if you, um, if you came tonight to hear about the possibility of um, a visual intelligence, um, you probably have already given some thought to the fact that we make many important decisions in our lives, um, some of which are, are kind of tricky, they're difficult. And psychologists are quite aware that um, some decisions are difficult, especially when the evidence we use 
um, does not very clearly point one way or another. So um, when we look at um, uh, many real-world situations, we might have decisions to make, like does this mammogram show a possible cancer? Is this tank turning the corner um, a friendly or enemy? Uh, does this passport photo match the person in front of me? Um, whose fingerprints are these that I'm finding on you know, this table? Um, so the question I raise today is whether there is evidence for a general ability to learn such visual skills. And, um, and by general, I mean an ability that would be common to many different domains, such as the ones that I've just mentioned um, in the previous slide. So we might expect, um, if this ability is general, that the person who can be the best bird watcher might also be the person who will be the best at matching fingerprints. So, so why is it important that this ability would be general? Why, why do I ask if it's general, rather than perhaps a separate ability for each task that, that we're going to perform? Um, and and um, I'd like to emphasize the fact that this, this general, the idea that, that this intelligence would be general, is, is very critical to the definition of cognitive intelligence, which we know a lot more about than we would about visual intelligence. So since um, Charles Spearman, who did a lot of the important work early on in the study of intelligence, um, psychologists speak of um, something they call G for general, general intelligence. And, and um, this is something that is a statistical concept. So let me introduce what you know, briefly what they mean by this. So this is a typical kind of model of um, general intelligence that you would see in a study of intelligence. And what psychologists do on these tasks, um, on the, in these studies, is that they measure performance on a number of different tasks. So they measure performance uh, across a lot of different people. Um, and so some of these tasks might be verbal tasks, some of these tasks might be spatial tasks, and, um, and people will vary on these tasks. And, and some of these tasks will kind of vary together. And so um, maybe people who are good at one kind of math task will be good at another kind of math task. And people who are good at you know, comprehension um, of, of, of text might be also good at vocabulary. Um, but Intelligence, so this would be kind of this, this organization, this level, where you have task clustering, um, well, the verbal task and the spatial tasks. But general intelligence sits at this third level. So we have the tasks here, and then this level where things kind of cluster together, where you have a few tasks that are similar and vary together. But general intelligence is this third level of commonalities between all of these tasks. Okay. So we define general intelligence by the proportion of what we call variability, how much people differ, which is shared among these tasks. And if, um, if we did not find this, if we did not find that you know, the person who is the best at maybe a vocabulary task is also uh, likely to be very good at a math task, um, then we might, we might think of what's going on here as being very task specific, that what matters is practice in a given task is make you, making you good at this task, but does not generalize to another task. Um, but that's not what general intelligence is. It really seems to be something that is shared. Um, so um, as early as 1920, uh, Walter Scott, who was president of the American Psychological Association at the time, um, wrote these words, um, possibly the greatest single achievement uh, of the American Psychological Association is the establishment of the psychology of individual differences. And so during World War I, um, he was involved in you know, trying to make sure that you could test um, individuals um, in the army to place each man where um, he could best use his talents and skills. And since then, we've learned even more about how to do this, but not much about how to do this for visual skills. So this, this, um, what we've learned about is cognitive skills. And in fact, this, this concept of general intelligence um, really helps predict many different things. It helps us understand academic achievement, um, performance on a lot of different tasks, some things about um, health risk behavior outcomes. Um, and so it's been very, very useful, but we don't have the same knowledge about visual skills. Now, one challenge in answering this question about a possible general visual intelligence is that um, we, we may not think that people vary 
a whole lot in their visual skills. Um, it may seem that as long as our basic vision is corrected with glasses and we can see well, um, all we need to do to uh, perform identifying birds or matching fingerprints or doing any of these difficult tasks is simply a matter of getting enough training. Right? So you get the training and you can do the task. If you're motivated, that's all you need. Um, and if this was the case, then we would likely not find a general visual intelligence because the training that you need to get, you know, if you take the lesson to become a bird watcher, is unlikely to help you to match fingerprints. So we wouldn't really be uh, finding evidence there for something general. So you may ask, well, why don't psychologists know more about this? You know, what have they been doing? Um, and uh, the answer um, is, uh, you know, comes from the fact that We've been doing other things. So Lee Crombach, who also was a psychologist, was an um, American Psychological Association president uh, in the 60s, wrote these words, um, the cor correlational psychologist, someone who's interested in relationships between tasks, is in love with those variables that the experimenter left home to forget. So what does this mean? Well, it means that most of the vision scientists up to now have been interested in running experiments of the kind that are really useful to understand vision on average. How does it work? And we may study many different people, but we're interested in kind of getting rid of the differences between people and, and trying to describe how vision works um, you know, for the average person. So that's really the main reason why we don't know about visual intelligence. We haven't been doing this work for very long. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, really the beginning of, of this uh, research program. So, so psychologists don't know much about uh, visual intelligence. Um, and when we started, we wanted to know what people on the street, um, OK, not on the street, on their devices, because we did this survey um, online, but um, what they thought about it. So we asked 100 people about um, what, they, what they, their beliefs were about learning six different skills. So um, one was recognizing car models, one was learning a new math skill, um, one was learning to identify mushrooms, learning a second language, uh, learning to match fingerprints, and this is learning the, um, I don't know what you call them here, but the, the codes on the produce, the way that someone working in a grocery store would have to you know, learn um, as the cashier at the grocery store, so the PLU codes. So the question we asked is, well, if someone, would, if someone proved, you know, happened to be really good at learning, say, this task, for each pair of tasks, we ask, how likely would they be to be very good at this other one? Like, what's the relationship between any two pairs here? And when we did this and we looked at the result, um, what, we, what we saw was that people um, clustered these tasks, these tasks in a very obvious fashion. So they um, clustered these tasks, so learning a math skill, uh, second language, and basically a memory task together. And this is great because we know they're right. We know that's the study of cognitive skills, general intelligence. We know that people who are good at one of these tasks are going to be good at the others, on average. But what they also told us is that they clustered these tasks together. So they believed that someone who was going to be good at identifying mushrooms would also be good at matching fingerprints, for example. Now, we also asked them a second question, which is, how much do you think people vary in each of these different domains? How much, we call it variability, you know, so if everybody kind of is about the same, um, there would be very little variability. And so what they told us in this case is that each of these tasks, these kind of cognitive tasks, um, seem to vary a lot more then they believe the visual task to vary. So this is very consistent with what I suggested a second ago, which is that we seem to have an intuition that if we can see the world, we can easily, you know, each of us has the same sort of potential to learn to perform any of these tasks if we get the right training. So, um, so today my goal is to... Um, actually give you some evidence about this. So it's, it's nice to you know, ask people what they believe, but this is not what scientists do. They want to actually 
you know, try to understand how this works. Um, and, and there does seem to be, um, you know, from what we've learned so far in this research, some misconceptions um, that we can, you know, try to set aside. So one of them is that there is little variability, you know, in visual perception. Um, everything that we've done so far suggests that people vary greatly in the way that they perform these visual tasks. Another one is that you can tell how good you are relative to other people. So we often measure how good people are on a visual scale, but we also ask them how good they think they are relative to other people, and we find that people are really, really bad at predicting how good they are at, this task, at these tasks. There might be several reasons for that, and if you want to talk about this um, during the question period, I'm, I'm happy to entertain that. But um, basically, if you think you're great at face recognition, for example, or if you think you're really bad, you know, you, you just don't know. Uh, we can test you and we can tell you. Um, okay, and then the, the last misconception was that mostly visual skills depend on training. You just need to learn, um, you know, what it is that you need to look for in the images. And that's true. You know, you are not going to learn to identify birds if you don't get exposed to all of the species where you live. And the, but, but it's not sufficient. And two people getting the same training are not going to end up with the same level of performance. Okay, so what do we know? What have we found out about individual differences in object recognition? So um, the first domain for which psychologists started to do research on this um, is face recognition. And the reason is that... Um, there are individuals, uh, Brad Duchesne and Ken Nakayama at Harvard, who looked at you know, what were the measures available out there that we could use, and they realized that most of the tests really had been designed to study individuals who either had brain damage or some other deficit. Um, and so they were tasks that were designed for people who were really, really very bad. But if you're interested in how people vary in the normal population, those are not the right tasks to use. So they did the field of uh, visual psychology a, a big service by creating a task that was um, uh, very good at measuring these differences. So what this means for the task to be good is that it's both um, easy enough for people who are very bad at face recognition to get started and get you know, at least a few trials um, correct. And it's also hard enough to be able to discriminate between two people who are at the other end of the spectrum and they're really, really good, but you want to tell which one is the best, this task is going to be able to, um, to tell. So the way the task works, um, if you, and you can actually do this task online um, easily if you're interested in how good you are at face recognition, um, you are exposed to uh, six individuals that you've never met, so you can study their faces, and then you get a number of uh, trials where you see a triplet, and you have to decide which of these is one that were, you know, was, was one of the six that you studied. Uh, some trials are fairly easy, some trials are a lot harder. Uh, eventually, they add lots of noise to the images, and those are the trials that are there for people who are really, really good at face recognition. It's like, oh, well, let's make it really, really hard and see who can still do it. Um, now, lot, this, this task has been used. It's called the Cambridge Face Memory Task, again. Um, this task has been used in a lot of research, and so we've learned a lot about individual differences in face recognition. We've learned it varies quite a bit in the normal population, so some of you are really good at this, some of you are probably really bad. Um, we've also learned that it is, it's a um, highly heritable ability. So what this means, and it, this comes from um, a few studies, but this is one that's showed really strong evidence for this. So what we have here is a correlation, so the relationship between uh, performance on this task, so the Cambridge face memory test, for pairs of twins, but in this graph, we have um, identical twins who share all their genes, and then we have uh, non-identical fraternal twins who don't, uh, who share you know, only half of their genes. And so what you have here is a much stronger relationship for um, the twins who are identical twins. And this is the sort of um, evidence for heritability that you see for cognitive you know, general intelligence. Um, so it's as heritable as cognitive um, intelligence would be. Um, the other thing that this study um, showed was that performance on the Cambridge face memory test, which I just showed you, um, is not 
related, it seems to be quite different from what these guys called um, general kind of object recognition. Uh, they measured object recognition with a test that is a test of um, memory for abstract art. So subjects were shown these kind of pictures of art that they'd never seen. They were trying to memorize them and recognize them. And um, what was found here um, was a, a, you know, a significant, this is a correlation. Um, and this is a correlation that is significant. There seems to be a bit of a relationship. And the reason it is significant is that they tested so many people. They tested 3,000 people. So even a small relationship is going to be significant. But the important part, and I want to make a point of, of explaining this to you because I'm going to show you many correlations. The, the important part is that um, what we're explaining here with one task on the other is about 7% of the variance. So this means, you know, out of all of the differences between people here, only 7% is, is shared between these two tasks. So really most of the information is quite different. Um, so, so what does this mean? Well, first of all, I would, you know, following this study, I would ask, in a single test that uses abstract art, um, can this really measure general visual ability? And, and the answer uh, would be probably not. We have a lot of experience with faces. Most of us don't have as much experience with abstract art, but this may vary. So some of the subjects might have had more than others. Um, and and it's, it's hard to know if this test of abstract art recognition um, has anything in common with things like fingerprints or car recognition or you know, identifying mushrooms. We just don't know because we don't have tests for this. So what we decided to do um, is to create these tests. So this is where our part in this research began. We um, created a battery of tests that we call the Vanderbilt Expertise uh, Test Battery. Um, and these are the categories we started with. By now, we've made tests like this for many more categories. Uh, but we had um, cars, planes, motorcycles, <coughs> leaves, mushrooms, uh, butterflies, and then owls and wading birds. And <coughs> the way this task works is very similar to the Cambridge Face Mermaid task. So I'm just going to summarize it for you. But let's say you're doing the test with motorcycles, so you would be um, exposed to six exemplars, six um, motorcycles that you study and try to, try to learn them. You don't have to learn their names. You're just learning the images. And you get a bunch of triplets, one at a time, um, where you're trying to find which of these is one of the six that you just studied. Um, <clears throat> it's not so hard because these show the, they show the exact same image. So you get feedback, and we tell you if you got it correct. We do, do this a couple of times, and then eventually we get to more difficult trials where the matching image is a different image, a different view, maybe a different viewpoint of one of the mo motorcycles that you studied. So it really does get harder. So um, this is an example for the planes that, um, that, that we use. So you would be, so why don't you guys try to study these for a second? Um, I don't know how much you know about planes. But um, so this would be a fairly easy trial. Anybody re you know, can recognize which one? One, good job. This would be a more difficult trial. So now that you did good with, what, with the first trial, which one do you think? Three? Good job. So you might, you know, this is two trials, but you might actually score really high on this test. Uh, some people can't even do the first trial. So, OK, so this is how the task works. <clears throat> so, so we have people do these different tests for a lot of different categories. And so when we look at the data, the first thing we look at is correlations. That's why. I, you know, wanted to make sure you guys were oriented with this. So these values here, those are the relationships between performance on these different tasks. So we have our planes, owls, mushrooms, motorcycles, and so on. And we also ran the Cambridge Face Mermaid test. Um, and this was on a group of uh, 200 and some subjects. And so when we look at these correlations on average, um, so just to orient you, like this is an example. This is the correlation between, you know, performance on the motorcycles test and the mushroom test. And so it looks like this with a lot of subjects. And there is, there's a significant correlation. But again, when you look at this R value, this correlation, what we always like to do is square it 
And when you square it, you get the percentage of the variance that is shared between these two tasks. So really what this is telling us is about 10% of the variance, of the differences between people on one test, is shared with the differences in people in the other test. So this is not a lot. And on average, for all of these tests, the shared, um, the correlation is, is about, it's 0.32. So 10% so is about the, the average value. But you see some differences, right, in this, in this matrix. In particular, um, the correlation between face recognition and other tasks tend to be, tends to be lower than average. Okay? And this, is, um, this you know, lines up well with some of the uh, claims that are out there um, in psychology that faces, face recognition is special, different from performance with other categories. However, um, for those of you with, uh, with good color vision, you may notice that um, cars, so performance for cars, is even less related to performance for other categories. Um, and this is not something that we expected, and there's no theory out there to say that cars are special. So, so this is, you know, there's lots of variability here, and it's <clears throat> not always clear how to interpret these results. So one interpretation would be this. Um, first of all, there's on average, between all of these skills, about 10% shared variance. Um, is this, you know, enough evidence to claim that there is a visual intelligence? Um, and most people would probably say no, because we're used to the fact that for cognitive skills, it's about half of the variance that is shared at the level of general intelligence. And then we also seem to find that some categories like faces and cars may be special, but we don't, you know, we don't really know why. Um, what I want to give you here is a clue that um, these results, these relations you know, and performance between tasks using familiar objects, categories like birds and cars, categories that you know, they can be very difficult to interpret. And why is that? Well, one of the things we did is we started to look at the relationships between tasks uh, for the gender separately. And so what you see here is just for faces and cars, and this is a result that we've replicated several times in different studies, what we find is that um, for women, there's almost no relationship <clears throat> between face recognition, sorry, and car recognition. So we have 4% 4, 4 shared variance here. But for men, um, how good you are with faces, predicts a lot better how good you are with cars. So in this case, it was about 20% shared variance. So there's a difference here between, in this case, men and women. Um, and I'm not, this is not a talk about gender differences. Um, they exist in object recognition, and it's interesting. But I think what this shows is that experience may matter, right? So and if you ask uh, our subjects, you know, how much experience, how much interest they have in these domains. The men reported a lot more interest with cars, and this may be what's going on. But the implications, the bigger implications, is that the question of how much there is in common between different abilities is really hard to pin down if it depends on the category that you use. So are you using cars? Or are you using birds? You know, if you use one category, it's going to be different from the others. And also, if it depends on, on the population and the experience that people have with these categories. So uh, what we decided is to try to think of a more direct way um, to measure general object recognition ability. So the first, um, the first important part in doing this was that we wanted to use novel objects. We wanted to set aside these familiar object categories because of the problem of experience. Because when we test 100 people on their car recognition, some of these people are going to have a lot more experience with cars than others. And that may be why they do really well on the car test. On the other hand, what we're interested in is their general visual ability, and that also may be, you know, they may be very good at object recognition in general, and that may be why they're doing very well on the test. And so we can't separate the contribution of ability and experience when we use familiar objects. When you use novel objects, we should be in the clear because nobody has experience at all. The other thing that we, um, that we have to do is something that has been done in 
if you like, uh, the, the study of cognitive um, intelligence for a long time. And it's called using a latent variable approach. So let me unpack that for you, because many psychologists don't even know exactly what it is. It, it, if you study individual differences, you're familiar with this, but if you don't, um, this is really jargon. What this means is that when we give people a, a, a task, a specific task, what we're measuring, what we're interested in measuring, is something abstract, their visual ability. But what we're getting is performance on this test right now. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of specificity, right? Maybe there's a strategy that works well on this task, and it wouldn't generalize to another task. And this is not what we're interested in. We're interested in measuring visual intelligence. And so the way we can get um, at the more abstract concept is to um, use several tasks, several categories, so that we can only kind of look at the common shared variance and set aside the little details that may be specific to you know, mushrooms or a memory task or stuff like that. So, um, so that's really what this means. <clears throat> so let me, let me introduce you to this study that we did. Um, and before I go on, I should say um, we were both very excited to do this work, to get the funding to do this work. This was funded by the National Science Foundation. And we were also terrified. Um, because this is work of a scale that we do not do as visual scientists. So if there are, I mean, I see a couple of my colleagues in vision here. If I say something like, okay, so we did a study, and it involves training more than 200 subjects, uh, and each of these subjects received about 13 hours of testing, this is just not a scale of work that we do. Now, there might be other fields where that's done, but we're not used to doing this. Uh, so it's exciting. If you do all this work and it doesn't work or doesn't, you, know, you don't learn anything from it, you're, um, you're going to be very sad. So um, we learned something from it, so don't, don't be nervous. Um, okay, so here's what we did. So first of all, I told you we needed novel objects. This is um, my lab um, has, has been studying perceptual expertise with novel objects for a long time. So we had a lot of these categories sitting around. Now, in each of these boxes, you see just four exemplars of a category of object that's just strange and you've never seen them. Um, but uh, we have many more in each of these categories. So we have a bunch of objects that look like this, a bunch of objects that look like that. I um, mean, we have a range. Um, the, the, the reason why we have you know, a range of categories um, is that what we do know about visual object recognition um, is that the way the objects, you know, how, what the objects look like matters. So for example, there are a lot of brain imaging studies that tell us that different parts of the visual system, and this is not a brain imaging talk, so I won't really orient you to what these parts of the brain, brain are, but you know, we're in the visual system here. Um, and, and what we uh, know is that objects that look like tools and objects that look like animals, um, they engage different parts of the visual system. And now we have, you know, among our categories here, some that clearly look more you know, organic, bug-like, um, and others that are more tool-like. So we might expect to, you know, um, we're interested in a general ability, but we are going to put something in the experiment that has quite you know, a large chance of um, uh, recruiting different skills because we know different parts of the brain are involved. There's also, um, again, brain imaging work that has shown that different parts of the visual system um, here versus there, are engaged by objects that are more curvilinear as opposed to um, uh, have uh, rectilinear kind of straight edges. Okay? So again, the point is that how the objects look seems to matter to what's happening in your visual system. Um, so we put this in the experiment, but what we're interested in is the possibility that the person who's going to be the best with one of these categories is the same person who's going to be very good with another one and the ones common. We also use three different tasks. And the details, let me just tell you, the details of these three tasks are not very important. What is really important is that we are using three different tasks so that what we're going to be looking at is you know, performance differences between people in terms of what's common between all of these tasks. So just so that you're oriented, um, the first task, and we did this for each of the different categories, but the first task we had is very, it's just like the Cambridge Face Memory Test and the Vanderbilt Expertise Test. So you learn six objects, 
and then on each trial you get three, and you have to pick which of these is one of the six that you just studied. Now you can, I'm sure you get the sense that with novel objects this is a lot more challenging than it is uh, possibly with familiar objects. Um, we also had um, what we call an object matching task. So on any one trial that the subject was facing, they saw one object and then a mask that they're supposed to ignore just to make things a little harder. And then a second object from a different viewpoint and they have to say, are these two objects the same or not? And then we had a part matching task where you see an object that's really made out of two parts, the top and the bottom of different, different little guys. Then you get this mask. And then you get a cue. In this, on this particular trial, it would be the top. And so what the person is supposed to do here is say, OK, the top of this object that is not on the screen anymore, it's the one that I had studied, is it going to be the same um, as this new object that I'm seeing? So they're matching the top part. They're supposed to ignore the other part. Um, so they're, they're just matching half of the object, you know, trying to, to get it from memory. Because again, they get the cue after uh, the object has disappeared. So three different parts. and. You know, these tests are made so that they have some easy trials, they have some trials that are really hard, so that we can measure differences between our subjects. Um, this is the design of the experiment. So each subject comes in, and they first, on day one, they get the Cambridge face memory test and the Vanderbilt expertise test uh, battery. So we measured our face recognition and familiar object recognition performance, just getting a sense for, um, for that. And then, um, for on, on um, days two and three, for one category, they're sent, they're sent home. That's why it's a home there. They're sent home with um, a code where they can play a game and get exposure to these objects. Now, the objects, the category is novel, so why do we want to give them exposure? Well, we we want to make sure that they, they're not you know, doing our task completely cold, that they have a sense for how these objects vary, you know, what is the kind of range of possibilities here. Um, so I'm going to show you in a second um, the, the little video game, kind of if any of you have played Space Invaders before, it's kind of a Space Invaders game. So they, they play this game for about two hours with um, objects from this category, and then they come back to the lab, so on day three, and they do our three tasks with novel objects from this category. So they've never, the, the objects that they're tested with you know, on, on these tasks, they're not the same objects that they played a video game with. They're just the same kinds of objects, okay? And then they come back and we give them another code and they play Space Invaders with the second category and then they come back to the lab and they get tested on the three tasks and so on. Um, so um, we lost a few people uh, through this design <laughs> who kind of at some point you know, decided that um, the semester was getting too hard and they needed to study harder. I'm sure that was the reason. Um, but we, we got a lot of people to finish it. Um, and the last category that they did, we did the testing on the three tasks, but they do not, they're not given any exposure at home. They don't play Space Invaders anymore. Um, and the reason is we, you know, because this is the first of any studies of this kind, we actually didn't, we weren't sure we needed this. Um, we wanted to know whether we needed it, and so we were going to compare kind of a con what we call a control category. Um, so, so we, oh, this is the game. Um, let me try to find. Oh, yes. Okay, so they have a shooter here. Um, they have to pay attention to the similarity between the shooter and the object that they're trying to shoot. They have two buttons, and if they shoot with the wrong button, the wrong guy, the whole display comes down really fast and they're going to die. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's not too hard, but it's hard enough that you have to pay attention to, sh to the shape of the objects, and that's what we want. So they complete 200 panels of this task for each category. Okay, so we tested um, 216 subjects, or I should say we ended up with 216 people who finished, completed the study. Uh, I think there was about 30 more who started it and for one reason or another um, did not finish. Um, and they, um, what's the, what we're showing here is that um, the, the, they, you know, the men and women we have in the um, study don't differ so much on their Cambridge face memory task and their object recognition test. So we're not going to look at gender anymore. We're just going to com combine that. And the first way I want to show you the results is um, showing you these correlations 
for each task separately between the different categories. So this is the first time that this, you know, we had any kind of data of this sort. Um, and the first thing that you see is that the correlations are higher. Remember, um, for familiar objects, they were around 0.3, and now they're much you know, higher for each of the tasks. The other thing that you can uh, notice is that this is the category that received no training, and these correlations here, and for each of the three tasks, they're not any lower. They're not different from, um, you know, so, so the category for which you have no training is as good um, in terms of predicting performance for the other as, uh, as the ones that you've received training. So for the purpose of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation, I'm just lumping all of these categories together. Um, this, is a, this is another measure of relationship, and I don't, I don't want to get into the details of, of how we compute it, but what's important can you hear me? I cannot move there. Okay, um, I won't. Um, the, the variance, this is again, this is this measure, it's kind of this R squared, the variance that is shared between these different categories is really high. Um, so this is telling us the way we would talk about this in a science paper is if we tested subjects with any five novel categories, and they could be other categories than this, this is how much of the variance we, we would um, find that's reliable, statistically significant, um, and that would be due to a general factor. So there's a lot of similarity here that we now see after having um, gone rid of, um, of the problem of experience, you know, varying between subjects. Okay, so, um, so this is really the first evidence for a domain general visual ability. Um, this is another sort of analysis that we did, and you can tell this is really, really complicated, uh, but it kind of looks like the graph that I've shown you for general intelligence before. And um, what I, um, uh, the way that I can summarize this is, so at this level here, these squares, those are the tasks. These are the measures that we, t that we took. So the three tasks for this category, the three tasks for this category. But the important level is this, this visual ability that we're interested in. Is there a evidence for a general visual ability. And um, the key is these values here, okay? um, and here's the R square. So what this is telling us is that there's a great deal of shared variance in performance on these tasks. Okay? The person who's the best at learning one of these is the best at learning um, the other one. So it's the first clear evidence for a domain general visual, visual ability. We find little effect of geometry. We put in categories that had you know, a, a good chance of showing differences, but they ended up being very similar. So that's interesting. Um, and we see a large effect of experience. What I mean by this is that there's a big difference between studying this question with familiar objects where experience is a problem, because it's a, we call it a confound. It's hard to measure visual ability when experience is kind of in the mix of, you know, in, in your performance, and it's hard to get rid of it. But when we look at um, measures where we're using novel objects, um, we, really, we really get rid of this. So this is, this is something that we learned that was really important. Um, so um, when, you know, a lot, of, a lot of studies out there show that performance between different categories seems to dissociate. It means that they're different, right? And that's where I started with familiar objects. Um, and this is often interpreted as, you know, in the brain there might be different systems for faces, for objects, maybe for living objects and non-living objects. But really what we think is going on is that the clustering, the differences, they're in the world. They're, you know, the fact that some people are more interested in maybe living objects and other people um, who are interested in cars are also interested in motorcycles and planes. And for this reason, when you measure performance, you're gonna find clustering. But the clustering is in the world, not so much in the brain. Um, so the last thing that I want to show you, and I'm going to, I, I want to keep, save time for questions. I'm going to probably skip a few slides here to make a simple point. But the question that some of you might have, given what I've shown you, is are you just measuring general intelligence, right? So you did a study where you had a number of tasks, and you found that there's something in common. And this is what psychologists have been doing 
with um, lots of different tasks. And so maybe if you added your tasks here, you would find that they're all predicted by G, this general intelligence. Um, and so we were really interested in this. We wanted to make sure that what we had discovered was novel and interesting and not more of the same. So we worked with um, some people, again, at Harvard in this case, uh, Jerry, J Jeremy Wilmer in particular, and he has a website um, called Test My Brain where a lot of people volunteer to go and do a lot of tasks just for fun. Um, they're not paid subjects. They're really volunteer, but... We test, they test a lot of people on this site. So we did a battery of tests, and um, to make a long story short, we did a test that's very similar to the Cambridge Face Memory Test and the Vanderbilt Expertise Test with novel objects. In this case, we used three different categories, so they happen to look like this. Um, but then we also use kind of classic tests of general intelligence, tests that are very good predictor of of G. So we had a vocabulary test uh, where you get a, a term um, that's kind of low frequency. You know, some of you read a lot, maybe familiar with this term. Others, you know, like, I've never seen this. Um, and so you get to pick which, you know, what pachyderm, um, uh, what you think it means. And then we have this, this classic test of um, intelligence, the Raven's matrices, where you have a display like this and you have to pick which of the, these options would complete the matrix. The ma the matrix. Um, so we had a lot of subjects complete these tasks. What's important to understand, though, is that subjects are volunteering, so it's hard to give them all of the tasks and ask them to do them all. So they actually, you know, they, some of the subjects will do all of the tasks, um, but um, some of the subjects will only, only do some of them. So this is the number of subjects we had who completed uh, our three visual tasks and then the, the measures of intelligence. And so, so what we're asking is, when we're measuring the shared variance here, so what, what you know, on this axis of the graph, the score for any one person, what it is is just the average of how good they are. How good were they in this visual task, but with the three different categories. So you have some people who are going to have a very high visual ability and some are going to have a low visual ability. How much is that predicted by the vocabulary test? And the answer is, is almost not at all. So this is a, um, some evidence that uh, visual intelligence is not general intelligence. Um, on the other hand, we found a small correlation uh, between performance on these tasks, these visual tasks, and the Raven's matrices. So, so this is a measure of general intelligence, and it seems to predict a little bit this task. But the key point, and I think that's the last data that I'm showing you, is this. Now, this is, this is a little complicated, but it's worth so let me tell you what this is. This, is, this happens to be the 37 subjects who performed um, tasks with two of the categories, these guys, and the Raven's matrices. So it ends up being only 37. And what we're looking at is the correlation. So performance for, and so this is a Griebel and this is a Ziggurin. Um, performance for the two object categories is quite correlated, and we know that. That's you know, consistent with what I've t told you. There's a general visual ability. Um, but the matrices, the measure of intelligence, you know, sh shows it predicts performance for each of these tasks. Now, what's interesting is we have a, statistic a statistical procedure, um, which we call partial correlation, where we can remove the influence of matrices from this correlation between the two objects. So what we're asking here is, how related is the performance between, you know, the Griebel's and the Ziggurin's after we remove the part that's explained by this intelligence task? And to make a long story short, it doesn't change at all. So what this is telling us is even though someone who's, you know, really smart, when they're starting to do these tasks with these novel objects that they've never seen, they might be a little better at, you know, forming hypotheses about them, uh, maybe using their what we call working memory to remember the, um, the features. Um, this is not what, what our V measure, our shared measure of performance is measuring. And we replicated this two other times with the other pairs of objects. And in each case, what's important here is that this value does not change each time we remove the influence of general intelligence from the test. So this is statistically the same as this. This is, well, this is exactly the same, so it doesn't change. Um, 
So, um, so this convinced us that um, what we have is likely very new. It is a visual intelligence. It is different from um, cognitive um, uh, skills. Um, and that's, that's exciting because in psychology, G predicts everything. You know, it really predicts a lot. So um, not everything, but a lot. It's pretty rare to get a uh, measure that is, um, is not predicted associated with G. So, um, so to wrap up, in, in many settings, um, we select people based on cognitive skills. But many decisions that people make, um, decisions that are critical, right, really important to, uh, to, to, you know, to you or people in, in a certain um, company or many different settings or to solve a crime, uh, these decisions that are critical, they're not made entirely based on cognitive skills. They're made based on perceptual skills. And what we just found out is that the ability to make these decisions may not be predicted very well by cognitive tests. Um, so linking what we um, are studying here to real world performance is going to be the next phase in this research program. It's really important for us to, uh, to start to understand um, how we can use visual intelligence um, and apply it in the way that cognitive intelligence has been used to you know, allow us to predict a lot um, in the real world. So in my, my conclusions, um, understand, if you want to understand the structure of the mind, in this case, the structure of the, uh, our visual abilities and why people differ in their skills, it's um, really, really important to account for the role of experience. Because as psychologists measuring performance, um, experience is going to have a big influence, but that's, that may not be what we're interested in. In this case, we were interested in this visual intelligence that people bring to, um, to the lab when they're doing these studies. Um, and so we had to, to do you know, quite a lot to partial that out and learn about visual abilities. Um, studying um, individual differences when experience is equated. So we gave people some, you know, they played the video game, but everybody played the video game the same amount. So we equated experience. And when we did this, we revealed quite um, strong evidence for a domain general factor. And so this visual ability that we measured here, um, it, it's quite exciting that it differs from, uh, seems to differ from general intelligence uh, because this is what tells us that we may be able to predict performance in situations that for now, um, you know, we really have, we have no way to account for them. So we may be able to do more new things, and that's always exciting. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank you, and I'll take your questions. In your experiment, uh, there's uh, one control experiment that uh, means that uh, the person are not uh, get familiar with these shapes at first and right. just go directly to the task. So how does this performance uh, compare to the, peop uh, the trials which people get familiar with these sh shapes? That is such a good question. Look at um, so yeah. thank you for this question. Um, so, with what I told you so far, you might have concluded that providing them with this experience, you're playing this um, video game, made no difference. And it's not quite true. It didn't make a difference for the story that I was telling, so I kind of set it aside. However, um, one thing that, so this is the category that receives no training. This is the correct reaction time. This is the part matching task. And this is giving you an example of, first of all, the difference um, uh, so people are slowing down for the familiar to the objects that they're trained. So this is interesting. Uh, but what, we're, um, what I didn't tell you is that this task is a measure. It's, it's actually it's a, called it a part matching task. But for Olivia, um, especially, this will mean something. This is also a task that we call the composite task. It's a measure of what we call holistic processing. So some of the trials that are the blue ones here, they're congruent. Remember when you have to, I'm asking you to map um, and to ignore the bottom part. Sometimes the bottom part is the same, 
And so it's kind of giving you the same answer as the top part, but sometimes it's different. And that's, we call that incongruent. Um, for the objects you have no training with, this makes no difference. For the objects that you have trained with, what we're seeing here that you're actually um, better on the congruent trials than the incongruent trials. What this is telling us is that after experience, it's not a lot, it's about two hours, after experience with these sorts of objects, you become um, what we call, we call this more holistic, okay? But what this means is that I'm asking you to pay attention to a part and you can't do it anymore. You are paying attention to the part I'm telling you to ignore, okay? Um, so you're changing the strategy. And what the, the reason why this is really interesting as a change is that a holistic strategy is really, really um, important for face recognition. There's lots of research in psychology telling, you, telling us that the way we recognize faces is very holistic. It's very difficult to pay attention just to the eyes. If you do something to the mouth, it seems to change the whole face and so on. Um, so we're, we're making, by giving the training, even just a little bit, we're making um, object recognition more holistic, more face-like in a way, uh, which is in my lab, um, you know, our, what we've, said and, and, and uh, offered evidence for in many, many studies is that this holistic processing that you have for faces, it's, um, it comes from experience. It comes from expertise with a category. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it does make a difference. It changes the strategy that you seem to use in recognizing these objects. But it does not change the correlations that I've shown you in other ways. So another question for me. So these are artificial uh, objects uh, seems to me just uh, looks like one category. So my question is, so if you think about an airplane and jets, uh, they are kind of in similar category, but they are different in shape. So if you do a task on these two different subcategory, so what's the similarities between them? Can you get a kind of uh, common intelligence between these kind of sub intelligence as a sub category, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Because I believe for these kind of artificial things, our brain may use the same area to identify their difference. So maybe, I mean, if you use some fix the category, so make sure that the brain uses similar areas to process this information mm -hmm. and just change their subcategories. I think probably yeah. you can also get a common intelligence. It's, it's, it's a, thank you for your question. It's a very good question and it's hard to answer. Um, you know, I can't really answer it for familiar categories. There is too much, the problem of experience, the confound with it, it's, it, it's so problematic in many ways um, that, you know, we, we, we don't know. Now, uh, you know, your question is kind of why I showed you at least some evidence from brain imaging studies that objects that are like these um, are often processed in different parts of the brain. Now, you're, you know, these two are more similar. These two are more similar. And, and we did this on purpose. We wanted to see in, in the study we did, are we going to find evidence that, you know, there's more similarity in performance between these two and more similarity between, we find none of that. Even this category, which is the most distinct, it really looks like little bugs that have you know, very little to do with these, they're, they're extremely correlated. Um, so of course you could, you could say, well, I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to create you know, novel object categories that are even more different and we could redo the experiment. This is the first study we did. We did it with you know, the, the, the best categories we had. Um, and hopefully there will be many more labs doing a lot of research on this. And, and we'll find out there may very well be still uh, an influence of visual similarity um, and, and, and many different factors. You know, they're about what the objects look like. Um, what was striking to us was you know, the difference, so if you, if you take the study with, with novel categories, with familiar objects that I've shown you, if you notice, two of the categories were birds, right? So we had owls and waiting birds. So you might expect there, to, to get just there's a lot of visual similarity in the shared experience. Even there, um, we do not find the same strong relationship as we would find between these categories. So there really is a big difference between studying 
um, these questions with novel objects and with familiar categories for which people vary in their experience. It's not so much that people are, you know, the problem is not that you're familiar with them. The problem is that some of our subjects with, you know, cars or birds or mushrooms than others. So, so I, can't, I can't fully answer your question, and it's, you know, it, it's a good one. Um, but um, I think it's not, it's not a big problem for the big picture message that I have today. Okay, uh, thank you again for your presentation. You. Um, I'm, however, I'm not clear on um, one of the, uh, a conclusion that you may have uh, uh, come to, because uh, I saw at the beginning of your presentation, you said, well, there are some misconceptions that we have, and one of them being that, so, well, everyone can uh, learn if, if given the proper training to do right. something. But this is, in fact, you know, uh, why I'm asking this question is I saw in the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the last photographs that you uh, uh, screened up there was, in fact, the military. And this is what the military bases their um, ability to uh, perform the tasks that they need to is that we can train, you give us anybody from the uh, um, general population and we can train them to do anything. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the photograph you showed there was, uh, uh, looked like, you know, well, uh, to, to read instruments, okay, there. Uh, you know, whether it be radar, you know, see right. blips on radar or images of sonar in a submarine. Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, basic premise that they're working on is you give us anybody we'll uh, and we will train them to right. be able to read these images. Right. So is that not, uh, true or not? Uh, so so, I, so thank you for your question and it's a very good one. We have not yet um, bridged that gap experimental work that we do in the lab with these novel categories and artificial tasks to real world tasks. We are in the process of trying to do this. Um, there are reasons why it's hard to do and one of them is that if you want to know if our measures in the lab that were now that they were designed to be really good measures, they're very sensitive to performance and you want to know if they predict performance in the real world, well what you also need is good tasks to measure performance in the real world, um, those tasks don't really exist. You have to create those too. Um, so we're, we're working on this. The first domain in which we're looking at this is um, reading chest x-rays. Um, so, we, so we want to ask these questions. But um, what, we, what we see in our studies where we give everybody the same amount of experience with all these tasks and these categories is that you know, we give them the same amount of training they perform vastly differently, you know. And the same person who is unable to learn it for, you know, the yellow category is still not very good at the, you know, pink one and the green one and so on. There are people who are not good at learning visual tasks. I mean, you can teach them a little, but not as much as the person who performs really, really well. So there are really um, important differences in the ability to learn, and this is, um, I think this is one of the, the important pieces of news for, you know, for the applied settings. Maybe it'd be the military or um, the medical um, trainings or, you know, there's lots and lots of real world domains where we just assume we can train everybody. Um, and if they're motivated enough and they're smart enough, that's enough. Um, and I think that we may, you know, with more work, we may find out that it's, it's not quite true. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk, fascinating uh, research. Um, my question is a bit of a long shot, it's sort of, uh, let's say, 10 years down the line. Uh, of course, um, to apply the findings of your research, we have limited human resources, so we need to find, I feel, some way to translate it to be processable by computers. Now, of course, computers are, I guess, very cognitive machines, as they are today. And then your research findings, would they mean, let's say, a complete end of... Uh, human vision or of, of, of uh, computer vision or, or uh, computer image processing as it is today and we would see like a new age of visual computing or, or how do you see the implications of your research on the on the computer world um i thank you for your question i, I hope that this research is not the end of, of anything out there um but um you know there are there are many many kinds of decisions for which um computer vision, computer processing is really helpful and yet cannot do the full task. There are still many tasks for which humans are really, really 
you know, the ability to make, um, to make decisions that, that for now at least we can't replicate. Um, but what we're learning here is that not all humans are the same. Um, and so at the very basic level, um, and I, you know, you, so you may be familiar with crowdsourcing, right? So if you're going to use like a thousand or more um, judgments from individuals who have very little training in, a, in an area and kind of get the average to help maybe feed some information to an expert who's going to make the final decision. What we're learning here is that it may be very valuable to uh, measure visual ability and kind of weigh performance, you know, the, the, the information you're getting from all of your subjects to and weigh that so that you're really basically using the people who can do this well. Um, you know, and, and if we can measure this efficiently, then that would be really useful. So I think that there are ways to integrate what we're learning here with inputs from, you know, including computer vision. But we're, we're really, 10 years, that's, yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Oh, they do, but they're not visual performance tests. But they're based on your ability, so you, you can't just train everybody. I couldn't be a pilot. Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. No, you, you're. I'm, I'm sorry if I if I um, uh, misled anyone here. They do a, they do a lot of testing entrance tests, and I'm familiar with what the batteries are. They are based on what psychologists have studied for many many years. They're all general intelligence tests and then some personality tests and other things. So there is nothing in these batteries that um, would predict visual abilities of the kind that we're measuring here. So that's what we're hoping is that because it is not correlated with the knowledge that is already measured in those entrance tests, we could add to what is being used. That's all I meant. No, I, was, it was, I know you have answered that. I was just reminded and said that the military can be trained anybody. That's not necessarily right, 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 right. Absolutely. I think it, this was perhaps made in reference to right. visual skills. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. <laughs>